looking for answers on why part of a Boeing 737 flew off, on where inflation is heading, on the future of Bitcoin investing, and on the whereabouts of a Secretary of Defense. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, Larry Fink of BlackRock and Bio Ogun Lacey of GIP on their big bet together on infrastructure. We believe infrastructure is only at the beginning of a real major asset class. So you put these two businesses together. We can go to governments, we can go to companies and offer them an integrated solution. Stephen Ratner of Willard Advisors on investing in 2024. I'm not predicting a recession, I'm just saying we're close enough to the edge. And Glenn Hubbard of the Columbia Business School on the economics of a second Trump administration. This week, Global Wall Street spent time trying to figure some things out, like why a brand new Boeing 737 MAX 9 lost a good chunk of its fuselage 16,000 feet over Portland, Oregon. We're going to approach this, number one, acknowledging our mistake. We are going to approach it with 100% and complete transparency every step of the way. We waited not so patiently to find out whether the SEC would finally approve Bitcoin ETFs, and finally found out on Tuesday. Oh, no, that was a mistaken ex post from the SEC that we got on Tuesday. It was Wednesday when the SEC actually did decide to approve all 11 applications for those long-awaited Bitcoin ETFs. What it really tells you is that, from a regulatory point of view, there's been some maturing of the Bitcoin market. The future of Ecuador seemed up in the air this week as armed gangsters seized a TV station and President Noboa mobilized the military. We spent much of the week trying to figure out why the Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, had gone missing for several days without even President Biden knowing that he was in an ICU unit at Walter Reed. Nobody at the White House knew that Secretary Austin had prostate cancer until this morning, and the president was informed immediately after. And Global Wall Street got another clue for the inflation puzzle on Thursday, with the latest CPI number showing that story isn't over yet. It looks like we little had a little hotter than we expected inflation during the month of December, up three-tenths of a percent. The forecast was for a two-tenths gain, pushes the year-over-year -year number up to 3.4 percent from 3.1 percent in November. The markets reacted to all this, and particularly the CPI numbers. But before we get to that, let's start with the big announcement coming from BlackRock on Friday. They would make a major move into infrastructure by merging with global infrastructure partners. And then going forward, it would put its entire business in the ETF wrapper. Right after the announcements, we talked with BlackRock CEO Larry Fink and GIP CEO Bio Ogun Lacey about what drove their $12.5 billion deal. I have always looked with envy, uh, with admiration, to what Bio and his team have done. We are both uh, refugees from First Boston. <laughs> we knew each other at First Boston. We have a common um, culture. Um, we laugh about what we learned at First Boston right. over dinners. Yep. Right. Um, and, 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 and so um, with the respect, the appreciation, uh, of, of GIP. When you think about GIP, what, what are they known for? They, are, they, they, they invest in major and larger projects than we did in infrastructure, like Gatwick Airport and Sydney Airport. Mm -hmm. But they're particularly superb in the operational efficiencies of these investments. They improve the quality of service. Um, and, and so if you think about what we have brought at BlackRock over the last eight years in infrastructure, what GIP has been doing since 2006, the two organizations look like a perfect match, and then you overlay the cultural connection. And, and we always underestimate the cultural yeah. connections. In our business, our business is a business of people. Right. And if you don't have that cultural connection, that friendship, that uh, continuity, right. it makes it harder to do. So I think we have the business strategy down. I am confident we are in the early part of this infrastructure revolution. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to, to have the scale, 
we wanted to have the expertise, the operational expertise of GIP, marrying that expertise with BlackRock's global relationships with companies and governments, marrying our existing expertise in decarbonization and infrastructure, it's a perfect partnership. So Bile, I think Larry's laid out the opportunity here, which is enormous. Let me ask you why you need BlackRock, and particularly, this is your life's work. Yep. The I in GIP is infrastructure, after yep. all. You've built this program. Yep. Why are you willing to give up your life's work and go to work for BlackRock? Obviously, we've been reasonably successful at what we do, and I completely agree with Larry. This is going to be the golden age of infrastructure investing, both in terms of the need for capital as well as investors who want that capital. Okay? And so the question we asked ourselves was, how can we accelerate the pace at which we're getting things done? Investing in new assets, as well as getting uh, pension funds, wealth funds, uh, asset managers to give us additional capital. And so if you look at the, 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 the marriage between ourselves and, and, and BlackRock, we do large cap transactions, they do mid cap transactions. They have a terrific infrastructure of debt business, it's primarily investment grade, Ours is primarily below investment grade. They have an infrastructure solutions business, which, which we, we don't have. So you put these two businesses together. We can go to governments, we can go to companies, large, small, medium size, and offer them an integrated solution. So that was very attractive. The culture is very, very important. I mean, Larry's right about that, okay? And the chemistry between our founding partners and Larry's team Fantastic, and maybe it's the first Boston DNA that all of us have that share. Maybe that's what, or, or, yeah. what, what, what does it. And then I think the third thing that was very important to us was uh, we actually went and studied what BlackRock has done when they've made acquisitions, okay? And the good news is they have grown the businesses. They bought the BGI business, $300 billion of assets. Today, $10 trillion. They bought the first reserve infrastructure business. Mm -hmm. They've tripled the size of that. So I've gotten this subliminal message about from, from Larry as to what tripling. he expects. Tripling, at least tripling, tripling. What, what he expects. <laughs> so that's, so that, that's, that's why we decided to do this. And, and I don't really consider this as you know, um, giving up. This is building a new partnership that allows us to take this business to a high, much higher level. We also talked with Larry Fink about his redefining the largest asset manager in the world to put the emphasis on ETFs. When we bought BGI in 2009, <clears throat> we were ridiculed by most of the financial community saying you cannot marry the culture of an active investor, that, what, who we were, and a, and a passive culture. And we said, why? Our clients use both products. Our job is to be agnostic to our clients, to work with our clients, to provide a whole portfolio solution. But over time, more and more clients started to think about how do I want to get an exposure? Do I want an exposure in this area or this product? And I could do that through actively investing in ETFs. In 2012, we said ETFs are going to be the new engine for fixed income. And boy, did that get a lot of ridicule by many people in the business community. And today, the fixed income markets are totally imbued by ETFs. And so at BlackRock, when we bought BGI, we had $290 billion of ETFs. Today, we have 3.5 trillion. And, and then this week alone, just yesterday, we launched the iShares Bitcoin ETF. And so I would say to you, if we could ETF a Bitcoin, imagine what we could do with all financial instruments. And so what we announced in our architectural change, iShares was this uh, was a business division in itself. And we thought that's too, in, in, you know, too exclusive. We needed to include the ethos, the philosophy, the spirituality of what iShares can provide in everything we do at BlackRock. Because we believe we're, we're just halfway there in the ETF revolution, that everything is going to be ETF'd. And we needed to ensure both active products, passive products, um, digital products are going to be used through the vehicle of ETFs. At the same time, in this architectural change, we're elevating the whole concept that we are going to be curating more and more of our performance-based products, too. So it's a, it's a very large architectural change. A lot of people have asked me, iShares is the most successful division within BlackRock. Look what it did. Why are you doing this now, and we believe it's so important to be anticipating the next move. Take us back to that world at Credit Suisse First Boston with the young Bio Ogunlesi and young Larry Fink. 
What are those people looking forward to today? Those people who are just entering the business, how different is it and where is it heading? Where are the opportunities for the people? What excites them? I, I would say for those who have a, a passion, a passion for investing, a passion to grow and learn, a passion uh, to do the right thing on behalf of your clients, the opportunity today is just as great as when Bio and I started our our careers at First Boston. Um, obviously, the markets are entirely different. They're much larger. They're much more efficient. But my gosh, I mean, the young people that we're bringing on board at BlackRock, um, those who show that imagination, that passion, their opportunities are going to be just as great as my opportunity uh, that I had. And I do believe that is the biggest differentiator between somebody who has this great career and someone who doesn't. You need to be in a career where you're passionate about, that every day you, want to, you have a desire to learn something new. You have a desire to impart that to your clients and helping your clients. And then when you get into leadership, your job is to make everybody smarter than you. Your job as a leader is to lift more people. And as a, as a big leader, your job is hopefully to have more people earning more money than you did. So I don't think anything's changed. Obviously, how we live our lives have changed. The, um, you know, you think about the role of the capital markets. I'm, in my mind, uh, two, the two biggest firms that were so instrumental in driving the growth of the global capital markets is our two founding New York City companies, and that's BlackRock and Bloomberg. And I truly believe there's a lot of similarities. When, our, when, when we started, I think Bloomberg started in 84, we started in 88. But the, but the knowledge barrier, the knowledge information, the expansion of the capital markets, the globalization of the capital markets, to me, that is what's driving the success. Coming up, we go through the week in the markets with Kristen Bitterly of Citi. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. It's time now to take a look at what the markets did this week with the S&P 500 up 1.8% to 4783. That is well above what the Bloomberg Securities Analyst Elves are predicting for year end, which is a median number of 4500. The Nasdaq was up over 3% and the yield on the 10-year gave up just 10 basis points to dip back below that 4% mark ending at 3.94. Here to explain it all to us is Kristen Bitterly. She's City Global Wealth Head of Investment Solutions. So Kristen, welcome back. Good to have you here. Yeah. So, yeah, great to be here. Put together the numbers we got this week. The CPI sort of pointed one way, PPI pointed another way at the end of the week with the sort of enthusiasm coming out of December. I mean, where are we at this point? Yeah, so it's really interesting. We actually, we launched in December our, our outlook for 2024, which is called Slow Then Grow, Investing in the Market's Big Reset. And I think what we're seeing in the data, it's very interesting. The market overreacts to a lot of the data, just like we saw in December. The market got a little ahead of itself in terms of pricing and rate cuts as soon as March of this year. But really, when we look through the data, I think there's a couple of things that still hold true. So inflation this week. We had CPI, people reacted to that coming in hotter than expected. But where did it come in hotter than expected? It was in shelter. Hmm. And so shelter naturally has that lag in flowing through into the data, which basically is really reflective of something that happened six to 12 months ago, not the present state of home prices. And so when we look at a measurement that's called Supercore, which is actually stripping out shelter, you're at about 2.2%. So there is a clear trajectory in inflation down to about 2.5% in our view by the end of this year. And the PPI data that we received actually reinforced that. That ultimately is going to flow through to consumers, which is actually kind of points to more of a disinflationary environment ahead. So what does that tell the Fed at this point? Does it need to cut? There's a lot of anticipation of cut, whether it's in March or it's in May, where it's going to be. But as you look at the numbers, are the numbers telling the Fed, yeah, there's really an imperative to cut at some point? Well, this is where I think the, the market, as I mentioned, it did get a little bit ahead of itself in December. We saw a rally in the equity market, but we also saw that pricing of a rate cut move up into to March. And so the Fed has, as I always say, it has a dual mandate. It's simple, not easy to execute on. And it's inflation and full employment. And so we've seen that resiliency of the U.S. economy. 
We've seen the resiliency in the job market. However, we have seen jolts come down substantially. We have seen the fact that um, for, for them, that with the employment remaining strong, they're going to keep an eye on inflation. They're going to look at this data. One has to give before you ultimately get to that first cut. One of the things that I think is beneficial to that story of the rate cuts is the fact that when you actually look at consumer expectations, they're coming down and much more normalized. So when we talk about investing in the markets reset, there's also this kind of normalization. There are a lot of distortions that came into play in prior years. This normalization creates some interesting opportunities. What are you hearing from clients? What are they focused on? What do they want to know from you? They want to know about the first rate cut. Absolutely. I think the other interesting thing that's happening is a shift where right now there is that concept of last year was about hard landing, soft landing, no landing, inflation, the health of the consumer. This year you are seeing a shift into more geopolitics and into elections. Mm. So when we look around the world, you have so many major elections that are going to happen in 2024. It's, it's about equal to about close to 70 percent of the global mm. market capitalization is going to have an election in, in their country. So I think we may move away from this constant focus on a recession. That's something in our belief that happened in the past. So one of our big calls this year is that we're going to see no landing. Hmm. The recession that everyone was anticipating was something that already occurred, and we saw it in profits. We saw it in manufacturing. Earnings actually troughed last year. And so there's a lot of kind of positive outlook for investors. That's what I was going to ask. Where are we in, with earnings going to 2024? Because it was pretty modest in 2023. Yeah, it was very concentrated, obviously, within the Magnificent Seven. And you can see that dislocation between the valuation, where if you strip out those kind of Magnificent Seven, you can see the rest of the U.S. equity market essentially at a 45 percent discount. But what we saw last year, if you look at Q1, Q2, we were in profits recession. Q3 was really where we began to turn a corner. This idea of a broadening out of the rally, because we've hit peak inflation, because we see interest rates coming down, that means that you can actually expand profitability into other, other sectors. And so we see earnings growth of this year around about 5%. So not knocking it out of the park, but a markedly different story in that concentrated story that we saw last year. Profitability into other sectors. If you were going to pick one, what would you pick? Oh, that's a tough question, but I'll, I'll give you an example. I actually think we're going to see a broadening pretty much across sectors. But one of the areas that I will mention is healthcare. Healthcare was a story last year that was really concentrated in, in two companies, and it was all about GLP ones, and it was all about how much we weigh, right? <laughs> it was all about which, trust me, from an innovation standpoint, was really remarkable. But right. I think when you look at that particular sector, there is a broadening out story. Again, going back to interest rates coming. Down, down, right. M&A activity that we're seeing, an expansion into biotech and med tech. These are areas that were not loved for the majority right. of 2023 and a really compelling story to invest right. today as well as for the longer term. Kristen, always great to have you with us. Thank you so much. That's Kristen Bitterly of City Global Wealth. Coming up, we talk with Steve Ratner of Will Advisors about what may be at stake for Global Wall Street in this year's U.S. elections. I'm not sure whether Wall Street will react well to another Trump victory. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. As we move toward U.S. elections in November, we're taking a look at what the policies of the candidates could mean for the economy and for business. Last week, we heard from economist Larry Summers. This week, we're joined by Steve Ratner. He's chairman and CEO of Will Advisors, which invests the personal and philanthropic assets of Michael Bloomberg. He is our founder and majority shareholder. Welcome back, Steve. Good to have you. Great to be here, David. Now, we don't know who the candidates are, first of all. We're yes, still we early on. Correct. Uh, but we have two frontrunners uh, in the present president, Joe Biden, and the once president, maybe future president, Donald Trump. Just taking those examples, what do we think we know about what the econ economic policies would look like under those two presidents? Well, these are vast, they have vastly different visions, of course. Uh, Joe Biden is a kind of FDR Democrat, lean in. Government can be a positive force in the economy. Let's pass the infrastructure bill. Let's implement the IRA and so on and so forth. And so I think you'd expect him to do more of the same. I think there's a real question about who's going to control Congress, 
which may limit his degrees of freedom. The budget deficit is $2 trillion, and I think people are starting to focus on that, which will limit his degrees of freedom. But there's still an enormous amount of implementation that he can and should do of the laws already passed, as well as a lot of stuff that can be done regulatorily. For, uh, and this is not one I happen to agree with, but for example, the extraordinarily robust antitrust enforcement that's going on at the moment. I think you see all that from him. I think Donald Trump has gone even further into the populist world, uh, based on the rhetoric at least, and based on the advice he's getting from people like Bob Lighthizer. And you're going to see a very protectionist, mercantilist uh, economic policy, uh, including things like banning imports of television uh, sets from China, which you know, seems kind of ridiculous. You know, we import all our bicycles from China. We're going to stop having bicycles and so on. So he's got all of that. And I think you will see um, a, an absolutely opposite regulatory approach from what you would see from Joe Biden in terms of uh, let a thousand flowers bloom, let people go do what they want, and let's roll back the regulatory state. So a lot of the traditional economists might really take issue with some of what Donald Trump is proposing. But what about global Wall Street? Because as you described that, you know, a lot of more government, more regulation on the one hand, less government, uh, less taxes, I would say, uh, less government involvement on the other. A lot of the business community would say, well, the second one sounds better to me. Sure. There, look, there were a lot of people who basically uh, on Wall Street, who you and I would know, who voted for Trump once or even twice. Basically, look, I don't like the guy, but I like the policies, and they got what they wanted. The tax, the TCGA, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, being the most prominent. But you'll remember, a lot of us kind of got this wrong on election night when it looked like Trump was going to win. Initially, the market crashed. Then people said, "Wait a minute!" Like three o'clock in the morning, they said, "Oh, wait a minute!" The market soared up again, and it kind of took off from there. And then you had COVID and whatnot. Uh, this time may be more complicated because Trump's policies are not mainstream Republican orthodoxy. He's often the populist world with all these tariffs, which business hate, uh, with shutting down immigration, which business hates. They need the workers. So I don't know that global Wall Street, and plus all of his anti-democratic authoritarian talk, I think it scares people. And so I'm not sure uh, whether the Wall Street will react well to another Trump victory. What about the, the protectionist stance? Because he has said 10% tariffs across the board. Robert Lighthizer referred to, he's written a book that says, we'll keep going, we'll keep increasing until we eliminate the trade deficit. What could that do to the economy, perhaps not just the United States, but also globally? I mean, we had something called Smooth, Smooth Hawley, as I recall, back in 1930. Yeah, I mean, Smooth Hawley didn't cause the depression, it exacerbated it. The depression and the crash that happened before Smooth Hawley, people thought Smooth Hawley was a solution to it. And of course, it just made the problem worse. It, would be, it was like leeching people in the old days. And that's kind of what it is. Look, from a, I don't think there's any debate among serious economists. From a macroeconomic standpoint, trade is good. Therefore, moving against trade is bad in terms of the impact on the overall economy. Whether we go into a crash and depression, I'm not sure I would predict that, but it's bad. On a micro level, the problem with uh, free trade, so to speak, is that there were jobs lost. The opening of China into the WTO unabashedly, un un unquestionably caused us manufacturing jobs. But the overall economy was better. Everything you and I bought was cheaper and better because it was made in China. And yeah, we can reverse all that. We can ban television sets and bicycles from China. And uh, the consequences would, would be not, I don't think, disastrous, but they would be noticeably bad. You mentioned anti-democratic initiatives, as they can be called, of President Trump. What about the rule of law? That feels a bit abstract. Uh, at the same time, how much of our economy is really based on the fact that we sort of know how the legal system works, uh, how the courts will rule in a given case, in a commercial dispute, for example, or when bonds go bad? We know what that is. If that got undermined, what could that do to our economy? Look, the rule of law is fundamental to the function of a capitalist, free enterprise society. And if you look around the world at countries, and you say, you know, the economic development people say, okay, well, what do we need to do to get this country moving again? Rule of law is always like number one, two, or three. It's at the top of every list. So obviously, uh, stepping back from that ha could have a pretty bad consequences. He hasn't really said too much about that yet, so we don't really know. And look, it's uncharted waters for us. We've never had a president or even a candidate seriously say, I'm going to roll back the rule of law. But it would be bad. We all know it would be bad. How bad? I I'm not sure I'm ready to predict that yet. Steve Ratner will stay with us to go through the lay of the investing land in 2024. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. It's true for investments, and it's certainly true for entire years. 
the overall performance of 2023 was encouraging in many ways, with inflation coming down while inflation-adjusted income went up. History was not a good guide to 2023. Um, some things really were different this time around. Um, at least so far that inflation unemployment trade-off that people thought would be require a severe recession in order to bring inflation down uh, hasn't come to fruition. The economy exceeding expectations in growth and jobs. Labor is in a stronger position than it has been for much of the past few decades. Unemployment is very low, the economy is very strong, there's a shortage of labor, the labor market has changed after the pandemic, and so there's a sense that labor is in a stronger position. And certainly the stock market way outperforming what we expected for the year. What an incredible year for equities. I was wrong, I predicted, David, that the markets would be down this year because, well, gee, the Fed raised interest rates 525%, should have had a rough market. But one way in which 2023 was not at all encouraging was in climate change, giving us the hottest year on record. What we're seeing now is just repeated examples of natural disasters, climate extremes happening at scales we haven't seen before, in places we haven't seen them occur before. And so we're really in this period of growing natural disaster risk. And now we're on to 2024 and the need to anticipate how much the trends we saw last year will continue into the new year. Or, for that matter, whether we were reading the signals correctly even last year. Inflation looks relatively under control, but there's a lot going on underneath the surface and there are still substantial uh, risks. My gut is still that the market is underestimating the inflation uh, risks in the current situation and therefore probably overestimating the amount of Fed cutting that is going to take place. But it's a fairly close call. For his views on the investment terrain in 2024, Steve Ratner of Will Advisors has stayed with us. Steve created those 2023 charts we showed you as part of the year interview for the New York Times. So great charts. We've borrowed them from you, Steve. But give us a sense of going forward. You had the ones that defined 2023. Let's talk about what it looks like from your point of view of 2024. Let's start with the first one you had, inflation and rates. Right now, there's a lot of higher rates. Inflation seems to be coming out down just in the United States as well as around the world. Inflation has definitely done better than any of us thought. Uh, the economy has remained stronger, in the, even in the context of a, ver uh, of a low unemployment rate and inflation coming down. I think it's important to note, as Larry Summers has done repeatedly on your program, that you know, for all of the celebration, we're not at 2 percent yet. Uh, wage growth is still running at around 4 percent. If you assume 1 or even 1.5 per percent productivity, it implies an underlying rate of inflation of around 3, which is what core inflation is roughly running at. So the question is, does it get to 2? I don't believe the Fed is going to raise interest rates again unless something really untoward happens. But I think it would be really hard for Powell to start cutting rates with inflation not yet even at its target. The market obviously has assumed substantial rate cuts this year. Most of the people I know and talk to, including my own colleagues, I think generally we feel that the idea of six rate cuts, 125 to 150 basis points of rate cuts this year, seems pretty unrealistic to us. And therefore, you have to raise the question, what's the implication of that for the market, which obviously uh, looks very closely at what the Fed and where rates are in terms of an alternative investment um, uh, Place. So how does it inform your decisions as someone who oversees investment of a lot of money about equities? Because earlier, a year or more ago, you were on this program saying you're not so excited about equities because the rates are high, they're going to go higher, and that's going to really cut into the value of equities given the discount rate. At this point, do you feel better about equities given the fact that you think probably it's not going to go a lot higher? Well, first, you were nice enough not to uh, get too in my face about last year, but I'm going to do a mea culpa and say I, I, think, I don't think almost anybody I know in the investing business expected what happened. Obviously, you had the Magnificent Seven, but even aside from that, uh, the S&P and the markets performed much better in light of high... You know, those rates right now are kind of where they were a year ago, but the market is, depending on how you want to measure it, anywhere from 15 to 25 to 40 percent higher than it was. So that's kind of an odd development, frankly, relative to history. Anyway, look, looking ahead, I think we feel that uh, rates are not going to go up anymore. You did have at the end of the year uh, a nice surge in things like biotech stocks that have been hit hard by rates. 
So we're, we're cautiously optimistic, uh, or at least not scared, about the market this year because we don't see the Fed raising rates again. Uh, corporate profits are projected to be up a little bit, not a huge amount. The S&P multiple is still high, but it all seems kind of manageable in the U.S. What about growth in the U.S. for the moment? Uh, because a year ago, many economists were predicting a recession, didn't have it last year, not clear at all we're going to have it even in 2024 at this point. What are you looking at for growth for the United States going forward? I, I have no more wisdom than, the, than any economist does. I think the consensus is for a small amount of growth, something less than 1%. The problem with predicting recessions, it's a little bit like the old Roadrunner cartoon. You're running, you're running around, suddenly you look down and there's nothing below you. If you look back, I think you would find that more often than not, people did not say we were in a recession until we were well into the recession. And so I, I just, there are signs of the economy starting to weaken a little bit. The jobs market is weakening a little bit. Retail sales are weakening on an inflation adjusted basis a little bit. You, you do see signs of stresses and strains, savings rates, credit card usage. Um, subprime, auto delinquencies, things like that. I'm not predicting a recession. I'm just saying that we're, so, we're close enough to the edge that it could easily tip either way, in my opinion. Well, one of the things that you focused on, including in your charts for The New York Times, were on wages, and particularly what happened with labor unions, which was a big story in 2023. Right now, last time I checked, real wages are actually going up somewhat, slightly in the United States, as opposed to going down. Uh, that's, on the one hand, bad for margins for corporations. On the other hand, good for consumers, because they have more money to spend. As you look into 2024 and beyond, what do you think is going to happen with wages? Yeah, look, there's no question that part of why the economy was so strong this, uh, in 2023 relative to what people expected was because there was more purchasing power, inflation came down a lot, and wage, and wage growth went up a little bit. And secondly, you have this very large budget deficit, $2 trillion, uh, so the, the government's doing its part. In terms of wages, I think you're going to see continuing upward pressure on wages. I don't see a wage price explosion. I, think, I do think that... Uh, Expectations have been managed well by the Fed's rate increases and other, other things. And so I, you don't see, an, uh, as economists would say, an unanchoring of inflationary expectations. They seem to be under control. So I think you're going to continue to see wage growth in the 4 45 maybe 5% range. And then, therefore, you're going to continue to see inflation maybe in the 3% range. And then the question will be, what does the Fed do about it? I believe the Fed's uh, uh, summary of economic projections would have inflation pretty close to 2 by the end of next year. I'm not 100% sure we're going to get there. And as I said, I don't see them raising rates. I just see them delaying rate cuts if we don't get there. Steve, one of the things you focus on is immigration. You do it in the charts for the year end of 2023. You've written otherwise for the New York Times about immigration. Immigration is an issue, certainly politically. We have a lot of people coming across the border. We have northern cities, including run by Democratic mayors, really upset about it. At the same time, we need a certain number of workers coming in. Give us your views on where we're going with immigration in this country. Well, I got into this, David, because I was looking at China, and China's population is projected to fall from a billion four to 770 million by the end of the century because of their fertility rate and the fact that they have, they have uh, emigration. The 300,000 Chinese a year leave and nobody comes because it's a monocultural society. We take in a million a year legally, um, and if you just want to maintain our population, given our fertility rate, you have to take in four million a year or else our population will start to decline. So we need these people. We have a 3.7 percent unemployment rate. They're not going to take away American jobs, but it is, it is the most divisive political issue. And frankly, President Biden didn't say open borders, but he conveyed a sense that we wanted people to come here back from the first day of his inauguration. And the result is you have three million people a year now crossing the southern border and going through our crazy convoluted system. And the Republicans, therefore, have no political incentive really to solve this problem. Biden owns it. The country, even including Democrats, are very unhappy with our immigration policy. And I, there could be a deal in Congress. I think they're going to announce something this week. But um, I'm not that optimistic it's going to get passed. And, and finally, Steve, because um, you take a longer view as an investor. Are we just going to in a period where investors have to have lower expectations? We had an extraordinary period of essentially, I will call it free money, uh, and that benefited us in all sorts of ways, including investors, I would say. Uh, there's a lot of talk right now that we just have to lower our expectations about what returns and regular expected returns will be going forward. Do you share that view? Sure, and I share it for the reason you said, uh, but I also share it, uh, and I don't have these numbers in my head, by the following point. 
if you look back at what the market did in a five-year period or a 10-year period starting in each year, you will find that in years where the P-E ratio was as elevated as it is today, the market's performance in the ensuing five and 10 years was pretty modest. It was positive, but it was sort of low, mid, single digits is my recollection. And so a lot of this is where you start from, and we're starting from a very high level. And so sure, I, I, I think our expectations are fairly muted. And you and I have had a, had a conversation, I think last time, we're doing a lot more in credit, because if you can make 10% in very senior, well-secured credit versus what we think the market's gonna do, we are still shifting our dollars in that direction. Okay, thank you so much. Always great to have you with us. That's Steve Ratner of Willett Advisors. Coming up, we welcome back Glenn Hubbard of the Columbia Business School about the economic challenges we face no matter who is president. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Whoever is elected president of the United States this coming November will face a range of economic challenges, both short-term and long-term. For views on those challenges, we welcome back now Glenn Hubbard of the Columbia Business School, where he served as dean for 15 years after presiding over President George W. Bush's Council of Economic Advisors as chair. Professor Hubbard is the author of The Wall and the Bridge, Fear and Opportunity in Disruptions Wake. So, Glenn, thank you so much for being back with My us. My pleasure. Today here. So, we don't know who the candidates are yet, much less what policy is going to pursue. But based on what we know so far, we do have two leader and candidates. Uh, one of whom is president now and one of whom was president. So we have some hints, at least, about where they're going. As you look forward for global Wall Street, what should we be looking at? Well, I think it's important to set the stage. So we've got short-term issues, obviously, with the effects of monetary policy on the economy. We have budget challenges. But we also have long-term opportunities and challenges from the country, from uh, generative AI and other very good developments for productivity. The question is, are we going to be able to grab those? What strikes me in looking at least at President Biden and former President Trump's policies is less how different they are than how similar they are. So in terms of protectionism, in terms of a fondness for industrial policy, in terms of intervention in financial markets, the two men are more similar than they are different. There are clearly some differences and important ones between the two. But I think for business people, understanding that neither of these gentlemen is really embracing a growth and opportunity agenda is front and center. So that's rather surprising. We don't hear that too often, how similar Donald Trump is to Joe Biden. But let's talk about some other issues here uh, about populism and particularly, for example, uh, the independence of the central banks. That's something that has been sort of sacred in the United States for years and years, right? Uh, what about that? Do both of them regard the independence of the, of the Federal Reserve equally? Well, I, I think there are very important populist challenges. One is the Fed. So we're in an environment where I at least think interest rates will be higher for longer than many market participants seem to believe. That's an environment where anti-Fed sentiment it will be building on both sides of the aisle. And the question is, will the candidates honor the Fed's independence? I certainly hope so. It's very important for the country. A second populist challenge really is in globalization. You know, the song about, you know, you're going to miss me when I'm gone. <laughs> That's going to be true for globalization. And it's going to be true if we threaten the trade and prosperity that's made our country great. And then the third area is domestic politics. You know, the, the, the real trick in helping people cope with technological advances like generative AI and with globalization is to move people to new opportunities, not to promise them the past. But both of these candidates are doing the opposite. They are promising the past. That's really the challenge of populism. How do you give people a bridge to the future rather than promising them a wall for the past? And how can we afford it? Because the debt and deficit is a big issue uh, that's facing this country at some point. We certainly haven't been will willing to deal with it yet. Do we have any sense that one of these individuals, Donald Trump or Joe Biden, is more willing to step up to the bar and really a deal with entitlements? I wish I could tell you the answer is yes. The answer is clearly no. Neither one, and frankly, neither party is interested at the moment. But that they must for two reasons. One is we have to make choices. We're going to need to increase defense spending, probably on the order of a percentage point of GDP or more. Not only in the United States, but around the world, we're going to have to make some choices between defense and social spending. You know, going back to everybody's favorite course economics, guns and butter, <laughs> we're, going to be, we're going to be back to that. Uh, and the second is we've got budget challenges that have to be addressed. Social Security trust funds, Medicare trust funds will be running out in the coming decade. Either candidate ultimately will have to do something. 
So I'm not asking you who you're going to vote for. I'm not sure you even know who you're going to vote for. But are there candidates out there with economic policies that you think are different from the similarities you see potentially between Donald Trump and Joe Biden? Well, I think there are. There's certainly a number of prominent Democrat politicians that differ. They're not running for president. On the Republican side, uh, Governor Haley is clearly an example. Her record in South Carolina was saying, rather than talking about the past, let's try to give people a bridge to the future. And South Carolina, of course, brought in new industries, new ways of doing businesses. That's the kind of discussion we need to have. We need a real discussion between, are we going to help people with policies that get them to a new place, or are we just going to promise them the past? Can you have those policies get into a place without basically spending more money and borrowing more money? Yes and no. So no in the sense that helping people is going to cost money. I have in mind ideas that would help places left behind, uh, ideas that would help training and community colleges. Those aren't free. They're, however, nickels on the dollar of what we're spending in some of our larger social programs. We should be able to make choices, whether it's minor tax increases, whether it's changes in entitlement spending that help us do that. So, so one of the things that we always hear is it's all about pop, pocketbook issues ultimately in elections. That's what people vote. That could be a good thing or a bad thing. As you look right now, uh, what is the pocketbook issue going to be for this year? And I guess more pointedly, why is it that the American people don't really seem to feel the economy is in a good place? Because there are a lot of indicators that it says it's not in a bad place at all. That's true, but I think the American people are right. I think what most people are feeling is the pressure of inflation and higher prices. So as economists, we say, well, inflation may be coming down. But to a person who's buying goods and services, prices are still high. And it's very hard for wages to keep up with that. So a lot of average Americans uh, are still struggling. And there's also the longer term fears. People know the roiling changes that are coming in the world from technology. And they're wondering, do they and their children have a seat at that table? So both the current pocketbook issue and the longer run, I think, really rivet most Americans. Do you think there's a certain just delay in getting your arms around the fact that the gas is coming back down in price, for example, or the price of bread isn't going up as fast anymore? There are some people who say it's six months, it's a year before people really, it sets in that actually inflation is not that big a problem anymore. Well, inflation will be coming down. I'm, I'm not sure it's going to come down as fast to 2% as the Fed seems to believe it is. But prices, the level of prices, when people go to the grocery store, those are still high. And people's wages are not rising as fast. But there are a lot more jobs. I mean, you would think that that might sort of counterbalance it to some extent. I mean, they, this, there have been a lot of jobs created under this administration. There have. And, and I think that's a very, very good thing. But I think people are still worried about employment prospects and they're worried about the purchasing power of their wages. And I think importantly, they do blame the government for some of the lost in purchasing power and they're not wrong. We have a lot of challenges facing us, geopolitically, politically, any way you look at it. I, I think at least going back in history, innovation has often been the answer for the United States here. Uh, what do we need to do to make sure innovation comes to the rescue once again? Well, innovation is the answer. But the answer toward innovation can't be target industrial policy from Washington. It shouldn't be a president, a college professor, anybody who decides what innovation is. It should be up to the, the market. What the government needs to do is really ramp up support for basic research and ideas and applied research around the country. And we will get the innovation that this country is good at. We then have to help more Americans cope with that innovation. Innovation sounds great if you're a scientist or a business person. It might be a little bit less great for some others. We need to help everybody along. Do we, need a, do we need a program right now to determine what AI will do to jobs and where we can help some of those individuals that may lose their jobs? Well, we need to start thinking about it. In the past, new general purpose technologies, that is technologies that are so big they bring everything along like AI, those have led to as many new jobs or more as the jobs they destroyed. The jury's still out on AI, but we have time if we focus. Glenn, it's always such a treat to have you here. Pleasure. Thank you so much. That's Glenn Hubbard of the Columbia Business School. Coming up, preparing for luck at 16,000 feet. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Finally, one more thought. It was the Roman philosopher Seneca who taught us that luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. And many of us spend much of our time looking for the luck and hoping we've prepared for it when it does come. 
like the luck we all had when pharma came up with a COVID vaccine faster than anyone imagined. A luck born of years of companies like Pfizer investing in research. It's not about Pfizer, I think it's about the pharmaceutical industry. I think this industry demonstrated the value that brings to society. Or Elon Musk's luck in becoming the richest man in the world after years preparing to make electric vehicles before most of us even knew that we wanted them. The more Model 3s we deliver to the field, it's actually causing viral growth of our sales. So we deliver a Model 3 to somebody, they love it, they tell all their friends, they're actually really our customers are our primary sales force. They love their car and take their friends for a drive and that's the thing that fundamentally drives our sales. And of course, sometimes luck can go the other way, when all the preparation we thought we'd made turns out to have been for the wrong thing, like for Silicon Valley Bank, that no doubt thought it was preparing for the worst by putting all that capital into long-term government bonds, only to watch the Fed raise rates faster than it ever had before, and in the process reduce the value of all those bonds. And we all know how that turned out. We need to recognize that uh a run on a bank nowadays is much different than it was uh, five, ten years ago. In very few seconds, you can move out money from, uh, from the bank. And so we need to take in account how we calibrate liquidity requirements, but also how we make the balance sheet of banks more eligible for uh, uh, access to the central bank window. And then we have the dramatic case of the Alaska air flight taking off from Portland, Oregon last Friday, only to have a fuselage panel blow out at 16,000 feet and narrowly averting what could have been a true catastrophe. It's not that Boeing hadn't prepared for safety problems with its 737 MAX aircraft. After all, they'd been grounded for nearly two years after two deadly crashes. And Boeing CEO assured the world that it had taken extraordinary steps to ensure their safety. As of today, our test pilots have made more than 700 737 MAX flights with the new updated software. We are making daily steady progress on these final certification steps. But despite all that preparation Boeing had reportedly undertaken, near disaster struck and Boeing is back to the preparation drawing board. But in that same dramatic story, we also saw a different sort of preparation result in what seemed an almost miraculous result. After the plane had landed safely, an Apple iPhone was discovered by the side of the road in the area. It had been sucked out of the plane and fell 16,000 feet. Almost unbelievably, that iPhone was still functioning in the airplane mode, with half a charge left on its battery and an email on the screen from Alaska Air about checked baggage from the flight. When Apple announced its new iPhone, made of titanium no less, some of us may have wondered what exactly Apple was preparing our iPhones for. And now we know. Maybe there's something to be said, after all, for getting our phones from asteroids. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.